Today I wanted to talk about why a lot of indigenous peoples don't subscribe to the colonial concept of blood quantum with the main issue being that it's more often used to deny us our own culture than it is to unite us. Another issue is that there are people who are 100% indigenous, but because their ancestors are from different tribes, they don't have enough DNA percentage to enroll with any of them. Then there are folks whose maternal and or paternal ancestries are indigenous, meaning that their roots are native, but because their family tree has influences from non-indigenous peoples, they get the Indianer than thou treatment. Most of us are aware that there are white people out here running around talking about their great grandmother or great great grandmother was 116th Cherokee, right? But what about those who check their family's claims and find out that they do actually have indigenous DNA? I'm specifically referring to people who have lived their whole lives with white privilege but are nevertheless eligible for grants and scholarships that were meant for people who have historically and systematically been oppressed. This isn't to say that they shouldn't honor or identify with their native ancestry. It's simply to point out that people who are at least phenotypically white benefit from blood quantum while it further marginalizes those of us who are more visibly black or brown. At the end of the day, what a lot of us subscribe to instead of blood quantum is the understanding that your connection to your culture is what makes you indigenous, not whatever percentage a DNA test tells you that you are. Now, I can't speak for everyone, but I know I'm not alone in the belief that there's a difference between a descendant and somebody who actually identifies with a given community. If you happen to fall into that first category, you absolutely have the right to connect or reconnect with your people, but you also have the responsibility of making sure you don't perpetuate colonial falsehoods along the way.